against a particular kind of matrix model play, where you have a one hot encoded input. Uh, each time we go from circle to circle, we're basically taking one piece of hidden state, one set of activations, and turning it into another set of activations by saying we're now at the next word. And then when we go from circle to triangle, we're doing something else again, which is we're saying let's convert the hidden state, these activations, into an output. So it would make sense, so you can see I've colored each of those arrows differently. So each of those arrows should probably use the same weight matrix because it's doing the same thing. So why would you have a different set of embeddings for each word or a different set of, uh, a different uh, matrix to multiply by to go from this hidden state to this hidden state versus this one, okay? So um, this is what we're gonna build. Uh, so we're now gonna jump into human numbers, which is less than seven human numbers. And this is a data set that I created which literally just contains all the numbers from one to 9,999 written out in English, okay? And we're gonna try and create a language model that can predict the next word in this document. It's just a toy example for this purpose. So um, in this case, we only have one document, and that one document is the list of numbers. Uh, so we can use a text list um, to create an item list with text in for the training and the validation. In this case, the validation set is the numbers from 8,000 onwards, and the training set is one to 8,000. Um, we can combine them together, um, turn that into a data bunch. Um, so we only have one document, so train zero is the document. Grab its dot text, that's how you grab the contents of a text list, and here are the first 80 characters. Um, uh, it starts with a special token, XXBOS. Anything starting with XX is a special fast AI token. BOS is the beginning of stream token. It basically says this is the start of a document. Um, it's very helpful in NLP to know when documents start so that your models can learn to recognize them. Uh, the validation set contains 13,000 tokens, so 13,000 words or punctuation marks, because everything between spaces is a separate token. Um, the uh, batch size uh, that we uh, asked for was um, 64. Um, and then by default, it uses something called BPTT of 70. BPTT, as we briefly mentioned, stands for uh, backprop through time. Um, that's the sequence length. So for each of our, um, so with each of our kind of 64 document segments, we split it up into lists of 70 words that we look at at one time. So what we do is we grab this, uh, for the validation set, entire string of 13,000 tokens, and then we split it into um, 64 roughly equal sized sections, okay? People very, very, very often think I'm saying something different. I did not say they are of length 64. They're not. They're 64 equally sized, roughly, segments. So we take the first 1 64th of the document, piece one. Second 64th, piece two, okay? Um, and then for each of those 1 64th of the document, we then split those into pieces of length 70. So each batch, right, so let's now um, say, okay, for those 13,000 tokens, how many batches are there? Well, divide by batch size and divide by 70. So there's about 2.9 batches, so three, there's gonna be three batches. So let's grab an iterator for our data loader, grab one, two, three batches, the X and the Y, um, and let's add up the number of elements, and we get back slightly less than this, because there's a little bit left over at the end that doesn't quite make up a full batch, okay? So this is the kind of stuff you should play around with a lot, lots of shapes and sizes and stuff and iterators. Um, as you can see, it's 95 by 64. I claimed it was gonna be 70 by 64. Um, that's because our data loader um, for language models uh, slightly randomizes uh, BPTT, just to give you a bit more kind of shuffling, get a bit more randomization, it helps the model. Um, and so here you can see the first batch of X. Yeah, remember we've numericalized all these. Um, and here's the first batch of Y. And you'll see here, this is 2, 18, 10, 11, 8. This is 18, 10, 11, 8. So this one 
is offset by one from here. Because that's what we want to do with a language model. We want to predict the next word. So after two should come after 18. And after 18 should come 10. Right? Um, you can grab the vocab for this data set, and a vocab has a textify. So if we call exactly the same, look at the same thing, but with textify, that'll just look it up in the vocab. So here you can see XXBOS 8001. Whereas in the Y, there's no XXBOS, it's just 8001. So after XXBOS is eight, after eight is thousand, after thousand is one, okay? Um, and so then after we get 8023 comes X2, and look at this, we're always looking at column zero, so this is the first batch, the first mini batch. Comes 8024, and then X3, all the way up to 8040, right? And so then, we can go right back to the start, but look at batch one, right? So index one, which is batch number two, and now we can continue. A slight skip from 8040 to 8046, that's because the last mini batch wasn't quite complete. So what this means is that um, every mini batch, sorry, every, um, yeah, every mini batch joins up with the previous mini batch, you know? So you can go straight from X1, zero, to X2, zero. We continue, 8023, 8024, right? Um, and so if you look at the same thing for colon, comma, one, you'll also see they join up. So all the mini batches join up. So that's the data, we can do show batch to see it. Um, and here is um, our model, which is doing this, right? So um, here is, just, this is just the code copied over, right? Um, so it contain, contains one embedding, i.e. the green arrow, one hidden to hidden brown arrow layer, and one hidden to output, right? So each colored arrow has a single matrix, okay? And so then in the forward pass, we take our first input, x0, and put it through input to hidden, the green arrow, okay? To create our first set of activations, which we call h. Assuming that there is a second word, because like sometimes we might be at the end of a batch where there isn't a second word, assuming there is a second word, then we would add to h the result of x1 put through the green arrow. Remember that's ih. And then we would say, okay, our new H is the result of those two added together, put through our hidden to hidden, orange arrow, and then ReLU, then batch norm. And then for the second word, do exactly the same thing. And then finally, blue arrow, put it through HO. Right? So that's how we convert our diagram to code. So nothing new here at all. So now, let's do, okay, and, and just, you know, so we can chuck that in a learner and we can train it, 46%, okay? Let's take this code and recognize it's pretty awful. Uh, there's a lot of duplicate code, and as coders, when we see duplicate code, what do we do? We refactor. So we should refactor this into a loop. So here we are. We've refactored it into a loop. So now we're going for each x, i, and x and doing it in a loop. Guess what? That's an RNN. An RNN is just a refactoring. It's not anything new. This is now an RNN, okay? And let's refactor our diagram from this to this. This is the same diagram, okay? But I've just replaced it with my loop. It does the same thing. Uh, so here, here it is. It's got exactly the same in it, literally exactly the same. Just popped a loop here. Um, before I start, I just have to make sure that I've got some, you know, a bunch of zeros to add to. Um, and, uh, of course, I get exactly the same result when I train it. Okay, so um, next thing that you might think then, and one nice thing about the loop, though, is now this will work even if I'm not predicting the fourth word from the previous three, but for the ninth word from the previous eight. It'll work for any arbitrarily length long sequence, which is nice. So let's up the BPTT to 20, since we can now. Um, and let's now say, okay, instead, um, um, 
instead of just predicting the nth word from the previous n minus 1, let's try to predict the second word from the first, and the third from the second, and the fourth from the third, and so forth, right? Because previously, like look at our loss function. Previously, we were comparing the result of our model to just the last word of the sequence. It is very wasteful, because there's a lot of words in the sequence. So let's compare every word in x to every word in y. So to do that, we need to change this so it's not just one triangle at the end of the loop, but the triangle is inside this, right? So that, in other words, after every loop, predict, loop, predict, loop, predict. So here's this code. It's the same as the previous code, but now I've created an array. And every time I go through the loop, I append h o h to the array. So now, for n inputs, I create n outputs. So I'm predicting after every word. Previously, I had 46%. Now I have 40%. Why is it worse? Well, it's worse because now, like, when I'm trying to predict the second word, I only have one word of state to use. Right? So, like, and, and when I'm looking at the third word, I only have two words of state to use. So it's a much harder problem for it to solve. So the obvious way to fix this, then, would, you know, the key problem is here. I go h equals torch dot zeros, like I reset my state to zero every time I start another BPTT sequence. Well, let's not do that. Let's keep h, right? And we can, because remember, each batch connects to the previous batch. It's not shuffled like happens in, um, you know, image classification. So let's take this exact model and replicate it again, but let's move the creation of h into the constructor. Okay, there it is. So it's now self.h. Okay, and so this is now exactly the same code, but at the end, let's put the new h back into self.h. Okay, so it's now doing the same thing, but it's not throwing away that state. And so therefore now, we actually get above the original. We get all the way up to 54% accuracy. So this is what a real RNN looks like. They, you know, you, you always want to keep that state, right? But just keep remembering, there's nothing different about an RNN. It's a totally normal, fully connected neural net, okay? It's just that you've got a loop you refactored. What you could do, though, is um, at the end of your uh, every loop, you could not just spit out an output, but you could spit it out into another RNN. So you could have an RNN going into an RNN. And that's nice, because we've now got more layers of computation. You would expect that. Um, to work better. Well, to get there, let's do some more refactoring. Uh, so let's take this code and replace it with the equivalent built-in PyTorch code, which is, you just say that. So nn.rnn basically says, do the loop for me. Okay, we've still got the same embedding, we've still got the same output, we've still got the same batch norm, we've still got the same initialization of h, but we just got rid of the loop. So one of the nice things about RNN is that you can now say um, how many layers you want. So this is the same accuracy, of course. Um, so here I'm going to do it with two layers. But here's the thing. When you think about this, right, think about it without the loop. It looks like this, right? It's like, keeps on going, and we've got a BPTT of 20, so there's 20 layers of this. And we know from that um, Visualizing the Lost Landscapes paper that deep networks have awful, bumpy lost surfaces. So when you start creating uh, long time scales and multiple layers, um, these things get impossible to train. Um, so there's a few tricks you can do. One thing is you can add skip connections, of course. Um, but what people normally do is instead, they um, put inside, uh, instead of just adding these together, they actually use a little mini neural net to decide how much of the green arrow to keep and how much of the orange arrow to keep. And when you do that, um, you get something that's either called a GRU or an LSTM, depending on the details of that little neural net. And we'll learn about the details of those neural nets in part two. They really don't matter, though, frankly. Um, so we can now say, let's create a GRU instead, so it's just like what we had before, um, but it'll handle longer sequences and deeper networks. Let's use two layers. Boom. And we're up to 
Um, okay, so um, that's RNNs, and um, the main reason I wanted to show it to you was to remove the, the, the last remaining piece of magic, and um, this is one of like the least magical things we have in deep learning. It's just a, a refactored, fully connected network. Uh, so don't let RNNs ever, ever put you off. Um, and with this approach, where you basically have a sequence of N inputs and a sequence of N outputs we've been using for language modeling, you can use that for other tasks, right? For example, the sequence of outputs could be for every word, there could be something saying, is this something that I, is sensitive and I want to anonymize or not? You know, so like, is this private, private data or not? Or it could be a part of speech tag for that word. Um, or it could be something saying, um, you know, uh, how should that word be formatted, um, or whatever. And so these are called sequence labeling tasks, and so you can use this same approach for pretty much any sequence labeling task. Or you can do what I did in the earlier lesson, which is once you finish building your language model, um, you can uh, throw away the kind of the, this uh, HO bit, and instead pop there a standard um, classification head, and then you can now do NLP classification, which as you saw earlier, um, will give you state-of-the-art results even on uh, long documents. So this is a super valuable technique and um, not remotely magical. Okay, so that's it, right? That's, that's deep learning, or at least, you know, the kind of the practical pieces from my point of view. Um, um, having watched this one time, um, you won't get it all, and, and I, I don't recommend that you do watch this so slowly that you get it all the first time, but that you go back and look at it again, take your time, and there'll be bits that you go like, oh, now I see what he's saying, and then you'll be able to like implement things you couldn't implement before, and you'll be able to dig in more than before. So like, definitely go back and do it again. And as you do, write, write code, not just for yourself, but put it on GitHub, right? It doesn't matter if you're think it's great code or not. You know, the fact that you're writing code and sharing it is impressive, and the feedback you'll get if you tell people on the forum, you know, hey, I wrote this code, it's not great, but, you know, it's my first effort, anything you see jump out at you, people will say, like, oh, that bit was done well. Hey, but did you know for this bit you could have used this library and saved you some time? You'll learn a lot by interacting with your peers. Um, as you've noticed, I've started introducing more and more papers. Now, part two will be a lot of papers, and so it's a good time to start um, reading some of the papers that have been introduced in this, in this section. Um, all the bits that say, like, derivation and theorems and lemmas, you can skip them. I do. They add almost nothing to your understanding of practical deep learning, right? But the bits that say, like, you know, um, why are we solving this problem and what are the results and so forth are, are really interesting. Um, and then, you know, try and write English prose. Um, not, not English prose that you want to be read by Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, but English prose that you want to be written, read by you as of six months ago. Because right? there's a lot more people in the audience of you as of six months ago than there is of Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun. Right? That's, that's the person you best understand. You know what they need. Right? Um, Go and get help and help others. Tell us about your success stories. Um, but perhaps the most important one is get together with others. Right? People's learning works much better if you've got that um, social experience. So start a book club, get involved in meetups, create study groups, and build things. Right? And again, they, it doesn't have to be amazing. Like just build something that you think the world would be a little bit better if that existed. Or you think it would be kind of slightly delightful to your two-year-old to see that thing. Or you just want to show it to your brother the next time they come around to see what you're doing. Whatever, right? Like, just finish something. You know, finish something. Um, and then try and make it a bit better. So, for example, uh, something I just saw this afternoon is the Elon, Ma uh, Elon Musk tweet generator. Okay. Uh, so looking at lots of uh, older tweets, creating a language model from, um, from uh, Elon Musk, and then creating new tweets, such as humanity 
will also have an option to publish on its own journey as an alien civilization. It will always, like all human beings. Mars is no longer possible. AI will definitely be the central intelligence agency. Okay, so this is great. I love this. And I love that uh, Dave Smith wrote and said, um, these are my first ever commits. Thanks for teaching a finance guy how to build an app in eight weeks. Right? So, you know, um, I think this is awesome. And I think, like, clearly a lot of care and passion has been put into this project. Um, you know, will it systematically change the future direction of society as a whole? Maybe not, you know, but maybe Elon will look at this and think, like, oh, you know, like, maybe I need to rethink my method of prose. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and so, yeah, create something. Put it out there. Put a bit of yourself into it. Um, or get involved in fast AI. The fast AI project, there's a lot going on. You know, you can help with documentation and tests, which might sound boring, but you'd be surprised how incredibly not boring it is to like take a piece of code that hasn't been properly documented and research it and understand it and ask Silva and I on the forum what's going on, why did you write it this way, we'll send you off to the papers that we were implementing. You know, writing a test requires deeply understanding that part of the machine learning world to really understand how it's meant to work. Um, so that's always interesting. Um, Staz Beckman has created this nice um, dev projects index, which you can like go onto the forum uh, in the fast AI dev section and find, um, actually the dev project section and find like, here's some stuff going on that you might want to get involved in. Or maybe there's stuff you want to exist, you could add your own. Um, create a study group, you know, Dean has already created a study group for San Francisco starting in January. This is how easy it is to create a study group, right? Go on the forum, find your little time zone subcategory and add a post saying, let's create a study group. Okay, but make sure you, you know, give people like a little Google sheet to sign up, some way to actually do something, you know. Um, a great example is Pierre, who's been doing a fantastic job in Brazil of running um, uh, study groups for the last couple of parts of the course. And, uh, you know, he keeps posting these pictures of people having a good time and learning deep learning together, um, creating wikis together, creating projects together. Great experience. Um, and then come back for part two. Right, where we'll be um, looking at all of this interesting stuff, in particular going deep into the fast AI code base to understand how did we build it exactly. We'll actually go through, um, as we were building it, we created notebooks of like here, we, here is where we were at each stage. So we're actually going to see the software development process itself. We'll talk about the process of doing research, um, how to read academic papers, how to turn math into code, and then a whole bunch of uh, additional um, types of models that we haven't seen yet. So it'll be kind of like going beyond practical deep learning into actually um, cutting edge research. So we've got um, five minutes uh, to um, take some questions. We had an AMA going on um, online and so we're going to uh, have time for a couple of the highest ranked AMA questions from the community. And the first one is by Jeremy's request, um, although it's not the highest ranked. What's your typical day like? How do you manage your time across so many things that you do? Um, yeah, I thought that I, I, I hear that all the time, so I thought I should um, answer it, and I think I got a few votes. Because um, um, I think um, people who come to our study group uh, are always shocked at how disorganized and incompetent I am. And so I often hear people saying like, oh wow, I thought you were like this deep learning role model and I'd get to see how to be like you and now I'm not sure I want to be like you at all. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, um, for, for me, it's all about just having a good time with it. Um, I never really have many plans. Uh, I just try to finish what I start. Um, if you're not having fun with it, it's really, really hard to continue because there's a lot of frustration in deep learning because it's not like writing a web app where it's like, you know, authentication, check. You know, uh, back-end uh, service uh, watchdog, check. Uh, okay, uh, user credentials, check. You know, like, you just, you're making progress. Where else, for stuff like this Dan stuff that we've been doing the last couple of weeks, it's just like, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. No, that also didn't work, oh, that also didn't work until, like, oh my god, it's amazing, it's a cat. That's kind of what it is, right? So you don't get that regular feedback. So, um, yeah, you know, you've you got to have fun with it. 
Um, and so, so my, yeah, my day is kind of, um, you know, I mean, the other thing I'd do, I'd say, I, I, don't, I don't do any meetings. I don't do phone calls. I don't do coffees. I don't watch TV. I don't play computer games. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family, uh, a lot of time exercising, and a lot of time reading and coding and doing things I, I like. So, um, uh, you know, I think, um, the, you know, the main thing is just finish, finish something, like properly finish it. So when you get to that point where you think you're 80% of the way through, but you haven't quite created a README yet, and the install process is still a bit clunky, and you know, this is what 99% of GitHub projects look like. You'll see the README says, to do, you know, complete baseline experiments, document, blah, blah, blah. It's like, don't, don't be that person. Like, just do something properly and finish it and maybe get some other people around you to work with you so that you're all doing it together and, you know, get it done. What are the up and coming deep learning, machine learning things that you are most excited about? Also, you've mentioned last year that you are not a believer in reinforcement learning. Do you still feel the same way? Yeah, I still feel exactly the same way as I did three years ago when we started this, which is, um, it's all about transfer learning. It's underappreciated. It's under researched. Every time we put transfer learning into anything, we make it much better. Um, you know, our, our um, academic paper on transfer learning for NLP has, you know, helped uh, be one piece of kind of changing the direction of NLP this year. It's made it all the way to the New York Times. It's just a stupid, obvious little thing that we threw together. Um, so I, I remain excited about that. I remain unexcited about reinforcement learning for most things. I don't see it used by normal people for normal things for nearly anything. It's an incredibly inefficient way to solve problems which are often solved more simply and more quickly in other ways. Um, it probably has a, maybe a role in the world, um, but a, a, a limited one and um, not in most people's day-to-day -day work. Uh, for someone planning to take part two in 2019, what would you recommend doing learning practicing until the part two course starts? Just code. Yeah, just code all the time. Um, I know it's perfectly possible I hear from people who get to this point of the course and they haven't actually written any code yet. And if that's you, it's okay. You know, you just go through and do it again and this time do code. Um, and, and look at the input, the shapes of your inputs and look at your outputs and make sure you know how to grab a mini batch and look at its mean and standard deviation and plot it and, um, you know, there's, there's so much material that we've covered. Um, if you can get to a point where you can, you know, rebuild those notebooks from scratch um, without too much cheating, when I say from scratch, I mean using the FastAI library not from scratch, from scratch. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be in the top echelon of practitioners because you'll be able to do all of these things yourself and that's really, really rare. And that'll put you in a great position for part two. Should we do one more? It's nine o'clock, yeah, let's do one more. Um, where do you see the fast AI li library going in the future, say in five years? Well, like I said, I don't make plans. I just, <laughs> I just piss around, so. Um, I mean, our only plan for fast AI, you know, as an, you know, organization is to make deep learning accessible as a tool for normal people to use for normal stuff. Um, so as long as we need to code, we failed at that. So the big goal, you know, because 99.8% of the world can't code. Um, so the, the main goal would be to get to a point where it's not a library, but it's a piece of software that doesn't require code. And it certainly shouldn't require a goddamn lengthy, hard-working course like this one, you know? So we, I want to get rid of the course. I want to get rid of the code. I want to make it so you can just do useful stuff uh, quickly and, and easily. So that's, that's maybe five years. Yeah, maybe longer. All right. Well, I hope to see you all back here for part two. Thank you.